All right, welcome energy enthusiasts to today's broadcast of DLS. I'm excited to have everybody here. Um, we are gonna have a whirlwind tour today. We are gonna go fast. It's gonna take the whole time. So if you were planning on you know, multitasking during this time, I wouldn't do it, wouldn't recommend it. I'd get your morning mimosa, I'd get your afternoon Lafroig, I would grab your coffee, I'd sit back, I'd listen, I'd absorb. We have a ton of stuff to go through. We're also gonna send you a ton of links afterward. We've got executive summaries written by the analysts themselves. We're gonna have downloadable videos. We'll have this presentation that's available. There's gonna be some videos online that'll be available from the analysts themselves. So um, grab those. Uh, we'll send out an email tomorrow, let you guys know what those are. Um, it's gonna be fun. So we're gonna move fast. I'll be your host today. Um, the team has put together a ton of information over 120 slides on detailed decks with each of these segments. And I boiled that down all the way into something we can fit in a nice package for the next 60 minutes. Um, my name is Justin Carlson. I'm the uh, Chief Commercial Officer and a founder here at East Daily. More important than who I am is who we are. So if I fast forward here, one slide quick on us. Hey, we are the valet. We are the garbage collector, the maid. We're the Roomba that cleans your room. We're here to collect supply demand data, aggregate it, put it with profitability and spit it out to you so that you guys can make more efficient decisions, more confident decisions. We deliver that through our data sets. We deliver that through reports. We have a team that is sitting around waiting for your call, waiting for your email, wanting to discuss the market dynamics, um, call them, um, we're excited to have you. We also have um, a consulting practice that's ready to answer your bespoke work. Company financials, natural gas, natural gas, liquids, crude oil, all delivered through our energy data studio. So we're here to scale, scale your intellectual capacity. That's what we do. That's how we serve you. Um, free trial to our energy day state studios right up top. Feel free to click that through this uh, presentation after the webinar. Just a quick pause. This is eight years of doing DLS. We have over 900 people registered for this webinar. So I am extremely humbled that we are able to have that sort of impact and deliver our content to that many people um, to benefit the energy sector, to drive transparency, um, honestly, to help you guys um, and your companies succeed. So it is extremely humbling. If you have questions, um, if you have feedback, hit that QR code, click there. We'd love to hear from you so that we can continue to make this better and continue the legacy of DLS. Um, we've come a long way. You'll note all the titles there at the top. You know, the first uh, three years of TLS, we couldn't even afford new satin sheets. We kept the same blue ones for the first three years. And, and now we've got a variety of new graphics and, and interactive content and um, platforms and just really excited and very humbled to have you all join us today. So. Let's dive in. So volatility reigns supreme. So as we talked about, you know, this is volatility will continue until morale improves. It's sort of a cheeky way to say, hey, well, we've got a lot going on. The space is moving. There are a lot of dynamics. We're watching a lot of stuff. I'm going to try to boil that down into some key themes or topics or areas that we're exploring. You know, first and foremost, gas, it is getting tight out there. We've seen that with recent market volatility, you know, 40 cent drop in natural gas prices over the last couple of weeks. Um, that's gonna continue as we have growing LNG demand, limited storage builds, um, new infrastructure, and then capital discipline is sort of this overarching, um, you know, theme across the energy space with, with producers. On the NGL, NGL side, the best defense is a good offense. There is a run towards building infrastructure to create a moat around um, what those companies are doing, drive competition within the space. Um, you know, ultimately, um, these companies are about capturing margin in the through a vertical integration. So we're going to dis discuss that. Crude, a tighter supply demand balance continues to exist. Um, there's some shifting flow dynamics that we want to talk about with regard to TMX and and volumes out of the Permian. Um, and there's, again, this less reactive supply from the Permian that isn't exactly responding to um, price dynamics. And then lastly, consolidation is a strategy. M&A will dominate midstream in the coming years. We expect that this uh, the uh, cash-rich companies 
we'll look towards M&A to drive some of their strategic initiatives forward in an environment where there is limited large scale new build opportunities um, and, uh, and, and still uh, opportunity to capture vertical, through vertical integration a lot of value in the industry. So um, super excited to have you here. Let's dig in. First and foremost, natural gas, tighter fundamentals will lead to heightened volatility. That QR code on the left is a QR code to ask for a gas market update. Um, the team put together a, you know, a 30 slide deck. I boiled that down into the eight most critical slides. Um, if you wanna walk through that 30 slide set deck, hit that QR code, click on that link. Uh, the team would love to share their thoughts with you. Near term, macro themes, elevated production and supply in storage is putting downward pressure on pricing. Obviously, weather has a big impact. We're going to explore that in the next slide. Mid-24 through to 26, what we've got is LNG exports. Um, there's going to be a lot of volatility with regard to FID, so that's one thing we're going to talk about. 27 through 30, uh, 30 um, that is a, an, an area where we are, uh, markets eagerly anticipating are more facilities going to get FID'd and what does that do to the long-term price curve? How does that interconnect with um, tier two basin growth? Um, uh, you know, just driving overall gas fundamentals. One big topic we're going to hit on here in regional themes is localized basis markets, West Coast, Northeast. Um, we're going to hit on uh, Houston Ship Channel. Um, again, volatility will reign supreme as we see some tight markets. Um, where if you lose a pipe, if you see a demand fluctuation, you're going to see some volatility in prices. So really fun there. Flexibility, high turn storage must be a priority. We're not going to dig into that too much today. We've got um, the natural gas team has some more detailed outlooks on that that they'd be happy to walk you through. Um, I did not have, we do not have time for that today, but it is some good stuff that we should talk about. Let's hit on the macro gas piece first. So I said we'll talk about the tail of volatility and volatility reigns supreme. You know, we expect prices to fall to 263 in April. Well, they're already there. And we've seen the last two weeks that, um, you know, we've seen a, a pullback in ResCom. We're going to talk about that or in demand, particularly on the ResCom side, due to winter, um, a lower winter, uh, lower winter demand um, and weather patterns. So we're going to talk about that a bit more in the next slide, but we expect to continue to see downward pricing, uh, pricing pressure with that ramp that you see in the back half of that as we prepare for um, for you know LNG and the onset of Plaquemines mines and Golden Pass. So that's gonna be a key theme and we're gonna wanna watch that. And if I had to give you two things to watch in the natural gas market and two things that we're watching, one, rig counts in the Hainesville because that is gonna determine how much supply response we see in the back half of 24 and then in how much momentum we carry into 25. And then the second piece that you really want to watch is SPAs towards FID of those non-FID facilities, because that's going to drive the back half of the curve and how the how that curve responds and how pricing responds, because we think it's too low at this point. If you go into 25, again, upward pressure on pricing as we start to meet the demands of that new LNG, um, we start to build some storage inventory over the uh, over the five-year average. Um, what that does, though, is it transitions us into this bit of a roller coaster back into the back half of 26, where we get a pause in momentum. Um, we have too much in storage. We're going to see some pricing pressure um, at that point before we get this longer term build. And again, this is very, very, very dependent on the uh, LNG startups, um, these non-FID facilities, and do they make full FID. Transitioning back to just real near term. What really matters today is weather, and we've seen that if we keep on the pace we're at, December will set and break a you know a decades long record of where December ending storage inventories are. So weather matters a lot right now. We have March as of our macro report in at the end of November, right before this decline happened. We had March finishing at 267. Obviously, we're watching that, and that might be something we have to update. Um, given what weather patterns do by the end of the year. Because the biggest thing here is, is that 2.4 BCF per day of ResCom. That's over last winter. As if you recall, we had two major issues last winter. It was a supply surge and a demand trough. This year, we're forecasting normalized weather. That's 2.4 BCF. And obviously, we're not getting normal, normal weather at this point in the year. So we're going to have to take a real hard look at that. If we don't, we could end um, end March at over 
TC TCF, as you see in that slide, that could be a lot of pressure on the market or would be a lot of pressure on the market. One thing you will note is that blue line is critical and that's something we watch very closely and that's the decreasing amount of inventory relative to the five-year average in storing. And as you see, as producers have pulled back, particularly in the Haynesville, we've seen supply come down relative to demand and it's allowing that storage inventory relative to the five-year average to fall. That will drive prices up, which will then incentivize producers, particularly in the Haynesville, to start um, picking up speed. Transitioning to LNG, we have now a bull case and a bear case. There's obviously been a lot of action in the LNG facilities. Um, we are still have our bull case for 34 BCF. That's what's built through most of this presentation. We're watching a bear case where it falls to 27 BCF. CP2, um, that's one that could fall off the list. Cameron, um, their train four could fall off the list. Commonwealth, we're watching very closely. I mean, these are all facilities, as you can see from the contracting dashboard there at the bottom that have less contracted capacity. We could see some of those contracts uh, moving over. You know, Cameron, for instance, has optionality to move back over to Port Arthur, um, fully fill that. So we could see that happen um, and that would pull back our forecast. Obviously, th that would put us in a position where maybe the long-term forward curve isn't so wrong. But again, that's why it's critical to watch these SPAs, which we track as closely as possible um, and as announcements are made, because we want to see if those facilities are going to come to fruition or not. On the right-hand side, you can see on the starred facilities are the ones that have FID, the ones below that have it not. You know, we still see uh, Saguaro coming into play. That'll play some interesting dynamics with regard to Permian supply because that'll push more Permian supply over into the West Coast market. Um, again, 11.2 BCF have, have FID'd. 11.1 is what's left. So we're going to watch that really closely for our clients. How that translates, if we get all of that, um, through 2030, production growth has to keep pace. You can see that in that top, uh, in the bottom graph, there's that 18.5 BCF of LNG growth. If you go up to the top graph on the right-hand side, you've got three BCF per day coming from the Eagle Ford, 12.9 BCF per day coming from the Haynesville. And this is where tier two starts to get interesting because it's got to make up the gap. We're going to talk about Haynesville inventories in a bit, but that tier two plays a role in the next slide when we start to talk about West basis. It also plays a role in you know, longer term uh, support for LNG. So as we get into the 2033 timeframe, we start to run out of inventory in the Haynesville or we're getting really tight, we're managing inventory, you see the Anadarko come into play. You see the Rockies come more into play. Certainly the Eagle Ford has already started to come into play. You got that three BCF for growth. Northeast is in play now. We'll talk about the Northeast and of course the Permian, um, the ever, ever stable presence in the gas markets continuing to put um, supply in. So uh, three, at 3.9 BCF per day. So we're gonna talk about all of these things um, here in a few minutes. First though, let's dig into some basis markets. We've got the West. Western uh, Canadian sedimentary basin up there at the top around four BCF per day on average. The Rockies is about four BCF per day coming across. That includes what comes from the um, uh, from the Western Rockies put basins as well as what sh gets shipped over from the Eastern Rockies CIG area. And then we've got the Permian 3.8 BCF. So a little history lesson here. Western Rockies has fallen about two BCF since 2018. So that is two BCF out of the Western Rockies that can no longer serve California, Nevada, Oregon, those markets um, that need it. That, of course, was highlighted in a big way when El Paso's 0.6 BCF per day outage blocked some of that Permian gas from getting to market. And you can see basis markets just went through the roof. So what does that mean going forward? You can obviously still see some elevated basis there. And the issue is Eastern Rockies, as you can see that arrow fly in from, from the on the right map there, is blocked at this point. You can't get more gas off across overthrust from the DJ coming across on Rex. Um, you cannot get that supply across. So going forward, as production continues to fall in the Rockies, again, we're at below Rockies prices, uh, break even prices to where producers are not incentivized to grow. Therefore, Rockies, Western Rockies in particular, continues to decline. We'll see some decline in total, um, uh, total demand, but that'll be offset by um, what's happening on the 
uh, on the coast on the Costa Azul side where it's going to start sending out more LNG. So going forward, what we're dependent on is are there more expansions to serve this market or do we hit a price point at which uh, producers start to produce again? Um, going over to um, the expansion side of things, GTN Express adds 150 a day. That'll come down from that WCSB small expansions. Where things start to turn a bit more is when Overthrust adds 325. That connects CIG with Opal with the Northwest Rockies pricing point. So that's going to bridge that gap and allow more supply to get off. We also, at this point, if you think about the forward curve, we're now entering a phase where we're heading into 27. Prices are starting to go up responsive of those LNG facilities, the long-term ones that need to get FID'd. And Rockies producers will start to produce more. Backfilling Western Rockies, that's that tier two basin production growth will come into play. That'll start to put some downward pressure on those longer term curves. So I know that's a ways out. And we've got a few years here of volatility and tightness in the Rockies market before these expansions come online. So for traders in the room, um, there's certainly opportunities there again volatile, volatile market, because this is an area where if you get another pipe outage like El Paso, it's going to cause problems. We want to monitor all of this. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner there, we've got a new West Supply Demand data report coming out eminently. So hit that QR code, um, reach out to us. We'd love to share it with you, share the data, um, and have you join us as we follow all of these dynamics going forward. Let's move across the country all the way to the Northeast, which we haven't talked about a lot lately, but is is interesting again because we finally are getting to a point where potentially, uh, hopefully, MVP, as you can see on there, D bottleneck zone five, adding about two BCF of capacity, but not two BCF of flows. We only project about 750 a day will flow through that. Part of that's going to go through that Transco Southside Reliability Project in 4Q24, Commonwealth in 4Q25. The the you know the bottom line is it's going to collapse spreads between dominion south and transco zone five because you no longer have a constraint getting between those two markets because mvp will not be full it will have open capacity and so that will bring those spreads down furthermore or for, so from that perspective you're going to see some tightening of uh, those longer term spreads in in transco zone five what's really critical and the thing to really watch and pay attention to is what that does to other markets. First off, we've got Rex, which has proposed a, a um, expansion out towards the east, 320 a day. That'll get uh, or provide ability for more productions to get out, relieving you know potentially some constraints to the extent it's not full. But the bigger one to watch that could dramatically shift the entire market is Transco Southeast Supply Enhancement Project, which started out at 800 a day, has ballooned to 1.4 BCF per day. Um, you know, from them, we, we've heard or they've said they've had to give more interest than that. What that does, though, is that enables the Southeast Gulf to send less supply because that supply can now be fed from the Northeast as producers grow into that capacity, shifting the null point on Transco so there's not so much pressure on the southeast gulf market from demand that's coming from the carolinas and from virginia and from that eastern seaboard particularly power demand which we've seen surge the other thing to pay attention to is transco's out the la edgy pathway which we'll investigate here in a second and that comes online in 4q um actually sorry that that's the wrong date but that comes online uh i think at 4q 24 no 25 i think um Anyway, uh, for that for that project, it's going to allow more supply to get from Texas all the way up into Louisiana. So really interesting there. Now, let's move forward and look at the Gulf. We had a super build last year. We have a super build this year. We narrowed the focus given we've had some of the Texas projects come online and we're just going to really dig into Louisiana. Certainly a lot's already happened in Louisiana with Gulf Run and Leap. Um, and Acadian coming online. Those are the red supply pipes, supply push pipes that are coming out of the Hainesville. What's perhaps more interesting now, because many of those are coming online and they're not fully utilized at this point because the Hainesville is pulled back. That's an important point when we get to Houston is the connectivity pipes that'll be coming online, Golden Pass certainly to feed, um, Golden Pass pipeline to feed, feed Golden Pass, but Tetco's expansion and uh, Columbia Gulf's expansion all to come down and feed that first phase of plaque mines, which 
we see as being enough to get through that first phase, especially CGT uh, is access through the Gillis Access Project all the way up into Gillis. That's enough capacity to do that, but it's tight. TGT Ev Evangeline Pass Pipeline longer term will play a bigger role in, in our opinion, in long term feeding of plaque mine phase two. Um, because that Southeast market's really, really tight right now. And it's something we've explored in, in pretty great detail. Fast forward a little bit into the future. There's that LA Energy Pathway, which, as I said, comes online in 25, 4 cube 25, not 27. Blackfin, a really important connector from Matterhorn across, doesn't fit across the Louisiana border. But it's important because in the next phase of this, you'll get the CP Express, which is a 3BCF pipeline. That'll cross the Louisiana border that'll open up capacity which is constrained right now between um or can be constrained between texas and louisiana at times so that's a lot of supply availability into that lower louisiana market um and a lot of new capacity comes online of course there's that southeast supply enhancement which you can see comes online in 4q27 effectively displacing about 1.4 bcf per day back into louisiana helping feed evangeline pass helping feed some of those other projects there in lower louisiana and providing an opportunity for gas um, to stay in louisiana that was produced in louisiana fast forward now there are a few more projects out there gulf run had up to a 3bcf expansion um, you've got ngpl texas louisiana expansion about 470 there's a tetco la gulf project that we saw out there these are projects that we wanted to highlight simply because as we get some of these longer dated projects that have an FID that like CP2, like Commonwealth, et cetera, those projects might need some of these, um, these uh, newer expansions to come online in order to feed supply. So there's QR code there right at the bottom for Louisiana. We have a Louisiana product and we are gonna blow it up, break it down and rebuild it into something that's even better and more comprehensive to capture everything that's going on here because it's complicated. Haynesville, everyone wants to know about Haynesville. We got to talk about Haynesville. Haynesville inventory calculations. There's the Arclitex there um, on the right-hand side with core well drilled, emerging wells drilled, non-core wells, the punchline. We see 12 to 15 years of inventory there. That's at that drilling curve that you can see in the top uh, graph there with the blue line. So that's not a current um, rig count. That's the that's the rig count as dictated by that um, blue line up there that gets to you know about 90, a little over 90. What's really interesting about that curve is we're sort of matching the curve from last year in terms of rig count growth and certainly matching the growth trajectory. So it's not out of the question. We've done it before. Hainesville producers have done it before. They can do it again. What'll be interesting to see is as we broach into the 20, you know, 29, 2030, you know, do some of those producers start to pull back? Because as you can see by 2030, the core wells are getting down to 40% remaining. The emerging wells are down to 30% remaining. So we are starting to run out of that life. In the map there at the bottom, you see the pinkish area. That's our core area where we've seen drilling happen um, and where we calculated uh, most of the core wells coming off of um, the purplish area, blue to purplish area is uh, those, you know, non-core, or excuse me, those emerging wells and then outside of that are the non-core. So again, punchline, we see 12 to 15 years of inventory uh, in that market, but again, are they going to start pulling back? Is that where you see um, tier two basins come into play? Now let's move into Houston Ship Channel. Houston Ship Channel, really fascinating market for perspective. Not so interesting, not a lot of basis movement. Houston Ship Channel just flooded, uh, moved in and out with respect to pricing relative to summer demand, filling storage, those sort of things. What happened though is first you had the 2BCF Whistler pipeline, which came across and shoved 2BCF into that Houston Ship Channel market. At the same time, we were growing Haynesville production, which needed a market to get out because of as prices escalated. That then pulled supply from Houston Ship Channel back into uh or excuse me from the Haynesville back into houston ship channel and created what's in that red circle which is massive basis dislocation but we built a lot of pipes since then um and in fact you can see and sorry that graph on the right there's that that run up of up to six bcf of east texas flows that came down into ship channel that's that peak at the top and that's that arrow that came down from east texas as we move forward though we've built a significant amount of pipe as i said those would come into play they're not being utilized as heavily now 
all those new pipes that we explored with the Haynesville, but they are going to be. As you look at the, the go forward, you're going to have Matterhorn come online and shove another two BCF into the Houston chip channel market. That's going to put a lot of pressure on flows coming in. Um, East Texas inbound flows will have to be diverted back. And that's that red circle on that graph as we, we project them being pushed all the way back into the Haynesville and then down those pipes. So um, that will enable basis to not get as weak as it was historically speaking, but we still see opportunity for it to get weaker. So those Haynesville pipes, even though they're not full, are really full now. Going forward, East Texas inbound flows, or sorry, uh, Corpus Christi, that's that CCLNG phase three will come online. That'll help bring some more demand into the market. Um, but at the same time, we expect we'll start probably start to see Eagle Ford to ramp up to meet some of that. Longer term, you've got NGPL expansions, you've got Rio Grande, that CP Express pipeline will bridge the gap between that South Texas arrow between South Texas and Louisiana. Um, you'll have um, Dry Eagle Ford at, you know, sort of the end of this time frame will have ramped up to three BCF, at least that's what we're putting into our forecast. Um, and so that market will then start to see some downward pressure. And you can see that in the forward curve now. Um, and so, you know, the forward curve's already accounting for that. I think we expect a little more pressure at the front and a little more pressure at the back. Um, we have a whole report coming out in February monitoring this. We built all of this out. Now we've just got to shove it into a board so that it makes a lot of sense to our clients. Whew. Okay, that was the gas market um, whirlwind tour. We went fast. Again, there is a lot more as well as on the crude side. We have a lot more here. You can see we have a QR code there and a link for the detailed crude market update, which again is, is a lot more slides that I have time to show you today. Um, but we're going to whip through the crude oil market. Um, you know, crude oil markets are um, sort of plowing forward, I would say. It's a definitely a tighter supply demand balance, and you'll see that in the numbers. Um, changes in crude flow dynamics will create opportunities as the market adapts. Um, refinery supply changes, there's going to be export infrastructure efficiencies um, that will you know, hit on at the very end of this. Um, you've got oil markets that are remaining tight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on OPEC. The crude team could spend a bit more time on that, but there's certainly they're monitoring price dynamics. They're monitoring um, you know, sort of the stability of, of the uh, pricing dynamics. Um, and then, you know, the Permian to U.S. food cor uh, corridor continues to tighten on the heels of a, you know, steadily increasing production. So just because we're pulling back doesn't mean um, that that we're not going to see production growth in the Permian. We still expect that. We've got a free crude news uh, a letter that please subscribe. We talk about all this, um, you know, ad nauseum. Let's dig into some of the content. So, here, what's important to know is we've got you know this difference between the blue area, which is total production coming in the market plus imports, and then the dark dotted line, which is refinery runs and the and the stacked uh, small dots that are on top of that, which is exports. So if you look at those two lines, it's it's a bit hard to see, but obviously the combination of refinery and exports overruns supply and imports. And that's reflected in that graph at the bottom where you've got that purple line, which is our excess supply available to above refinery um, demand available to meet exports. The supply is lower than the export line, ergo tight market, pulling from storage um, and what you see is exports and our expectation is exports are going to continue to do that as the world you know, demands Permian supply and, and utilizes that. And um, that's where you can see that spread there in the top right hand graph where you've got in the orange line, um, Brent and WTI in the blue line. And there's that spread there um, that is you know, sort of pulling US exports out of the market. Again, we'll talk a little bit about this, but you know, capital discipline still reigning supreme. You don't see producers responding to necessarily to those spreads or to even the run-up in crude oil prices. We don't expect them to. They're just sort of keeping a mandate of, hey, as long as we stay within the uh, within the confines of our our you know our agenda and our break-even prices, we're going to continue to plow forward and continue to produce. You know, somewhat to the um, I don't want to say they're ignoring fundamentals, but they're they're focusing on their own financial mandates rather than reacting um, too excessively to fundamentals. A lot of discussion about how the Permian plays a role, which we'll dig into in a second, but you can see the breakdown here um, of those 
you know, that capital discipline is superseded the reactivity to market fundamentals where you've got rig counts that don't exactly correlate anymore into the uh, price dynamics that are in the market. So historically speaking, we always correlated those rig counts with, with movements in price. Um, you know, I can remember a time when a, you know, a dollar on the curve meant five rigs show up in the Permian. That's just not happening these days as producers sort of stick to their mandate um, and, and plow forward. The other thing that's happening and something to really pay attention to here is consolidation. You saw the recent oxy consolidation. It continues to plow forward. Um, and one thing is, I uh, as we look forward towards, um, you know, what's happening in the market in the future is that we expect, um, or last year what we saw is about a 70% reduction in uh, private operator rigs once they were acquired by a public operating company. 70 percent. If that continues to go to happen going forward and we see public operators bring in private operators, reduce their rig count to align with their financial mandates, you could see a lot more pressure on Permian crude and, and gas development. And that's that yellow line there. We're not expecting that. We have our base case there in the orange line, but we're watching it because in addition to the backwardation of the curve, we've got this consolidation factor. If that uh, orange line were to occur, we could have a 14% reduction in our crude uh, uh, crude scenario and a 7% reduction in our in our uh, gas volumes, or to actually flip those around, 14% our gas and 7% our crude. The blue line there is the is the sort of flat rig count scenario where you don't see producers reacting to the forward curve and you don't see much consolidation. We're not as optimistic that that's going to happen. Certainly, you know, the enterprises and the planes of the world, that's closer to in line with what their projections are. Um, obviously, something to watch very, very closely and that we continue to watch very closely is how do, uh, how do, uh, how does the consolidation of the EMP space continue to affect rate counts as they align their strategies, you know, the public and private strategies? Um, there are exceptions to that rule. Certainly, Exxon with uh, Pioneer, I think, is a bit of an exception to that as Exxon sort of exports their um, advancements and their drilling techniques into the Pioneer portfolio. Um, but again, those companies were, were more well aligned already um, from a public company standpoint, not a public private. Oh, and there's that 70% acquisition um, there at the bottom. That curve, that M&A rig count curve is there at the top. You've seen a 24% re reduction in Permian rig counts. Um, and uh, ultimately, again, that orange area is those privates and how they've slimmed over the course of 2023. Um, again, we're watching that very, very, very closely in our Permian report to see and our uh, midstream um, rig tracker to see, you know, how does that, how does that um, dynamic happen going forward? With the Permian base crude scenario, there's some bottlenecks coming, which is an interesting change for the Permian market because you know we I can remember a time just a few years ago where it was uh, this overbuild will last forever, um, perhaps even hell might freeze over. Well, it perhaps has because if you look at those graphs on the right, we're going to hit that 90% utilization, which is sort of the walk-up rate level at where FERC mandates you keep 10% of your pipeline open for walk-up rates. So um, things are going to get a bit more expensive as producers have to start to dip into that and thus expansions start to become a bit more um, attractive for uh, producers to make those commitments. You see a bump up there with a possible gray oak expansion on that top graph, Corpus Christi. We still expect Corpus Christi to be a um, a you know incentivized because you're getting clean barrels into those export ports on the on the in out of Corpus Christi where you can load VLCCs through re reverse lightering. So that is an interesting dynamic we'll talk about or that's dynamic we expect to continue. Um, and the remainder as you filled Corpus Christi has flooded into that Houston market, which you can see on the on the bottom graph there where you see this ramp in what Houston's taking. Um, over time and, and ultimately hitting that utilization rate. So again, we're watching this market for there is the potential for more pipes here, um, especially even under our base case. If you got the flat rig case, you know, we may need some stuff sooner. Now to TMX. Um, TMX is a big deal. I mean, it matters a lot to how particularly U.S. refineries, but it also you know, matters to the export terminals. You've got the Trans Mountain Pipeline, you know, it was acquired by the Canadian government from KMI to ensure 
that a restrained Canada, restricted Canada that's been under sort of this, um, you know, capacity blockade, it couldn't get supply out for, for the longest amount of time, now has a new avenue to get about 470 um, contracted barrels out of market. Facility is actually larger. We expect it to balloon up to 525 in the long run. Um, but they can get that crude out and they're not as um, subject to capacity constraints as they've been in the past. Why is that important? Well, first off, it's going to impact pipelines that currently move crude. When you can get that TMX crude to global markets via uh, via Canada's you know, first and only uh, export terminal um, for, for heavy crude, it's gonna suck off some of the gas or oil that's currently going down Enbridge, that's going down rail. As you can see, we expect the 90 uh, million barrel a day reduction there. Keystone will lose some. There's some risk at Milk River and Express. So those are gonna lose some supply Going forward, you can see that bottom grass volumes at risk over time. Enbridge 221, this is all built into our crude hub model, um, 32 at Keystone. Longer run, we do expect, you can see on the right-hand side, that orange bar, about 280 response from Canada as it now has an avenue that has more capacity. So imagine that, you have more capacity, you can grow production. But the important part there is not I mean, losing the volumes from the U.S. is going to impact refineries. They're going to have to find new supply. Longer term, the bigger issue might be the impact it has on prices. And so you can see that in this slide here where we've just put Enbridge there. The 250 they lose goes down to Patoka, filters through St. James, down into the coastal markets, um, certainly through Cushing. The issue is that you've not only lost that 250 barrels that's coming into the market that you'll now have to find a new outlet for, You've also, as you can see from that top graph, you have strengthened the price, that red line relative to Mars and Maya, and, and you know, ultimately you've shrunk that discount. So that means everybody buying the remaining barrel in the US, that 336 of remaining refinery supply is going to pay a higher price for it because you've now opened capacity, you've trimmed that, we're expecting, you know, perhaps sub $10 spreads. Right now it's 12. It could get down to eight. So we've lost two to four dollars off of that spread. And that's more that's going to cost the refineries. So that's the importance of capacity and the ability to, you know, connect markets. Um, but it will, you know, what's good for Canada, it will strengthen Canadian crude prices and um, lift their ability to produce. So longer term, that's going to play a role. Where do you get those barrels? So refineries are going to have to look for new barrels. Um, longer term, that WCSB uh, growth will play a role. Short term, we expect there's some impacts on crude export markets where there's um, crude um, being exported out of the Gulf Coast that ultimately could be uh, retained or be competed for by refineries here. Um, you'll also, and that's particularly, and you can see in that top, you know, sour production is being exported on loop. And so these these are, you know, areas that we're watching for some attrition, even on the financial side, on the impact of companies. Um, so that's, we might lose some of that supply. Um, you also have some niche markets coming out of the Permian where barrels are blended. Um, heavy sour crude is blended with lighter stuff and sold into the market. And those barrels could become more valuable and that they may make it into the Louisiana market um, as, you know, not blended barrels. Longer term, you know, Gulf of Mexico production is growing. Um, there's about 150 a day of growth that we expect coming from Shenandoah and Somal Salamaca. Monica, sorry, and then um, certainly that Canadian growth um, forecast um, going forward. One last thing on crude, and then I'll dive into NGLs and then run into the finances, SPOT and BMOP. These are offshore terminals, um, allowed us to load the LCCs, the very large carriers um, without reverse lightering. It'll change a bit of the dynamic in Houston because we can get a more competitive barrel to market. So really interesting um we don't expect those to necessarily impact corpus because corpus has got the advantage of that you know neat clean barrel um out to market but it could certainly have some impact on reshuffling the deck or how crude exports certainly will have growth by then um and continued growth in in the permian so that you know the impact may be you know not as well it would probably won't be um all that big for the current facilities in there natural gas liquids uh you know, same thing, hit that QR code, click here, really detailed um, deck. The best defense is a, is a good offense. And this is a, this deck in particular, the detailed one's really interesting because we start to dive into the dynamics of, you know, different, um, how, how different facilities are going to compete with each other. Um, I'm going to hit the highlights. 
you know, the fight for the barrel is on, meaning we have ex we are going to expand capacity leaving the Permian, which means that everyone is going to com be competing for those barrels from the GMP facilities um, in order to fill their pipelines. That's going to put pressure on transportation and fractionation rates, the TNF rates, as I might refer to them. Um, that also puts the producer a bit in the... Um, you know, captain's chair, so to speak, with respect to having a little bit of leverage um, as they look for the best options for them. Um, but the um, pipelines are highly incentivized to try to win those barrels. A molecule lost, especially for the vertically integrated guys, because a molecule lost means 50 cents on the barrel gone. What does that mean? It means that if you consider that the, the full value chain of being able to grab the GMP all the way through the pipelines and, and, and down the line, if you lose a piece of that, you could lose up to 50 cents. I.e., If you lose the, lose the GMP, that's 50 cents on the dollar gone. On the downstream side, the other important part of that is that enticing producers to commit to your lines de-risks long-term fractionation and LPG export terminal development, i.e., we are a more global market. Crude, gas, NGL exports are critical to the growth, and they are what's driving growth. Therefore, developing and owning capacity at those terminals puts you in the captain's chair and obviously de-risk development if you're going to develop those things because you'll have customers to work with. Logistical path is ripe for M&A here. We'll talk about that in the M&A section with respect to company financials. ET, EPD, Targa have benefited a lot from connecting the value chain, Lucid, Navitas, and all these massive GMP systems in the Permian that now are folding under the EPD and Targa umbrella in that case. There could be room for a fourth alliance here. Cooperation is hard, I get it, but it may be essential um, for some of the non-behemoths there with ET, EPD, and Targa. So let's dig into that. A huge bet on growth in the Permian supply. What I want to point out here, and, and we'll build these numbers out here real quick, is Permian itself, Houston and Mont Bellevue, make up 60% of the CapEx spending from the companies we watch going forward through 20, 2025. 50 or 60% is going to that network and if you go down to the bottom left-hand chart, which comes from our CapEx dashboards on our Energy Data Studio, 49% of that goes to NGLs, 44% of it goes to nat gas. Within that nat gas bucket, most of that is GNP. We count that as nat gas because, um, you know, NGLs have always been thought of as a byproduct. They're not so much a byproduct anymore. They are really important from the value chain, as we'll look at. Um, so you really could move some of those numbers around. But at the end of the day, we've got 15, almost 15 billion, you can see there on the top right hand chart, 14.7 uh, to be exact, being spent by primarily ET, EPD, and Targa. And that includes their spend there on the GNP side, um, you know, of over over six billion dollars. So big deal there on on um, what they're spending. The question is, why are they spending it? Well, first off, they needed to build pipe and in this case, one of the areas, few areas in the market where we are actually overbuilding pipe, sort of back to the you know, 20, 2015 to 2019 timeframe and basically throughout the entire history of, of the energy markets, let's overbuild. They are overbuilding this to capture the molecules. Again, we talked about vertical integration. Um, certainly our Permian forecast, you can see this comes for an NGL network model. This is how we allocate both historical and forecasted volumes through the pipelines, including some of the stuff you see there with green switching around between the new Bahia pipeline and Seminole and Chaparral. I mean, we've all factored all these things in here. Certainly could be more room for growth. This production forecast for NGLs ties to our gas forecast, ties to our crude forecast. These are all linked um, through, our, through our production modeling. Um, there certainly could be more room for growth, but as we looked at in the crude section, we're very hesitant to get too aggressive on the Permian because of the backwardation of that curve and because of the consolidation we'd see going forward, um, at least through 24. Again, we'll continue to revisit that in our modeling and in our products. We're very hesitant. Um, the red line represents that uh, we're getting hitting down 70% of utilization in NGLs, which means there is a ton of open capacity thus a ton of fight for those barrels. Why do you fight for those barrels? Defending value chain economics is critical. Those barrel, uh, comical barrel charts on the left show that value, $11 on the barrel captured 
um, for the NGL value chain, where if you capture GMP, it represents 49% of that $11, pipe 20, fractionation 16, export 15. Allah, why are we why are companies looking to acquire GMP? 49%, half the barrel, 50 cents on the dollar gone if you don't capture that. Plus, you lose the advantage of capturing the molecule early so you can uh, monetize it down the chain in the pipe and fractionation and exports. That's a big difference from the crude side where you've got gathering pipeline and exports, but the refinery side is a different part of the market. So again, back to that overbuild and the compression on TNF rates to some extent is, is okay because they're able to capture GP, they're able to capture fractionation and exports and de-risk that. So we're watching that in our financial blueprints. Um, we're watching the pipelines for each of these companies. We're watching them to see how might that compression Im impact profitability of the NGL lines. At the end of the day, I don't know that it'll impact the overall uh, business because they're simply trading some of the value on the pipeline side in order to capture it on the fractionation and export side. Um, so it's a little bit of a Sankey chart flow diagram. What's interesting here is ET, EPD, Targa there on the left side, more than half of the NGL market out of the Permian is controlled by them. 25 owners, 125 processing plants. The rest is captured by non-integrated, PE, other, um, so half the market is three companies. Those 25 owners, 125 plants, slims down to eight owners and 10 pipelines. Now Lone Star, uh, excuse me, ET, EPD, Targa now are over 60% of the whole the whole shebang where Sand Hills, WTX, NGL 10 pipeline, Epic and Bengal and several others, you know, th that's a smaller portion of the market. So now they're capturing a lot of those barrels. So they're capturing a lot of their own molecules as well as some from other players in the space. What's really, and why there's, these are circled here, there is gonna be high competition for those remaining barrels because we're gonna have excess capacity on, you know, on these, on Bahia, on EPD's pipes, on Targa's pipes, we're gonna have excess capacity. So they're gonna be going out and looking to divert volumes, particularly from GNP systems that they've acquired from Sandhills, from One Oak. So that's a dynamic we're watching very, very closely as contracts roll off. How does that shift happen? And then ultimately downhill, downstream, you've got these behemoths divided up interest on the export markets. ET, EPD, and, and Targa have a have a big portion of that. Um, fractionation, it's it's got some spare pace now. In 21, we wrote a whole report on um on you know constraints in this market and, and rising rates. I mean, we don't see that right now, but longer term, we're gonna hit 100% utilization based on our current growth curves. We're gonna see it in another plant. So that's the big takeaway here. We're gonna see another plant. There's really, in all likelihood, only three companies that are gonna build it, ET, EPD, or Targa. They have control of the molecule. They have the growth potential. They'll likely uh, expand these fractionation markets. So we'll be watching for those. That'll, you know, to, sometime in 24, that's probably going to happen because it needs about a 1.5 year timeline in order to, you know, not hit constraints. So we're watching that very closely. Export markets, as I said before, gas is dominated. 30% of our gas market will be made up by exports. 70% of our propane market, as you can see from the chart there on the top left, is made up by our. Um, uh, 70% of propane is made up in our, or in our export market. Uh, the export market makes up 70% of the propane market. And then 20% of the ethane market is, it, it's small, but it's growing. Um, and so, you know, everybody loves lists. Compare ours to yours. Check it out. It's at the top, LPG, that's propane and butane. ET, EPD, Targa, certainly dominating the growth there in terms of adding future capacity. On the bottom side, ethane is dominated by ET and uh, and EPD wouldn't be surprised to see if Targa wants to play in that market again. They tried a few years ago. Um, I think they may try again. They've certainly got Galena Park. I don't know about the the capability of that to send out um, to send out FA or what capacity is there, but certainly something um, to look at. What does that look like going forward? In green is our exports and our export forecast. Uh, in in blue is sort of a low case scenario of development of new export terminals. And in light blue is a high case scenario. It's tight, 1Q24, 4Q24, and 1Q25. Exports are gonna get tight. 
if that is our growth market and we get tight in our ability to be able to send that out, that's going to put pressure on uh, prices. So we expect some continued pressure on propane prices. The team can you know, dig into that in greater detail if you want to spend some time discussing propane and ethane and all, all the other price dynamics going on. But I mean, fundamentally speaking, we're going to have a tight market getting out and you know, long-term EPD with that Beaumont Flex facility, you know, that that might keep us or prevent us from getting even tighter in that long-term 26 time frame. Whew. All right. Last piece of this, midstream company financials. Again, QR code. Again, click here. Uh, again, our team would love to talk about this. Midstream company uh, consolidation is a strategy. Why is it a strategy? Scale, growth, and long-term value. Those are the three buckets we're looking at. Scale, can companies uh, that are not heavily focused on uh, or in an environment where connecting the value chain is so critical, can you use m a as a strategy to develop that value chain? A la Targa and Lucid, Enterprise and Navitas, as I said earlier, those were critical component, components in developing that value chain, capturing the margins on each piece of your infrastructure, and, and ultimately capturing the molecule to de-risk your long-term strategy. Growth, another strategy. Can you get access to uh, NGL or to export markets for crude, gas, or NGL, either directly or indirectly through you know, how you feed those markets? Williams and Trace, energy transfer and enable, uh, which is you know more about the Haynesville and, and growth there. Enbridge and Moda. I mean, these are recent examples that we'll talk about um, with how companies were looking to expand into growth markets or use growth markets in order to be connected to, as I said, the driver exports on both the gas, crude, and NGLs because those are the markets that are growing. There's some element of long-term value too in many of these. Williams, Williams and KMI's acquisition of Curitin and Williams has done a lot more acquisitions in the in the Rockies, which is really interesting from a tier two, you know, long-term growth strategy or long-term value strategy, um, and certainly uh, KMI with with the South Texas pipelines um, acquisition, which gives access to Mexico as well as um, you know feeding off of some of the Eagle Ford growth that that's down there. Um, so this tier two strategy, you know, we call it long-term value. These are not necessarily bargains because the market is looking for growth and expecting growth. So the ergo sellers may not be super incentivized, but I'll talk about why they might want to reconsider that. Um, we'll also expect to see M&A between public companies be in the headlines, and we're going to explore a few of those. So stay tuned. Don't don't log off before the end of this, because we're going to talk about some, some tie-ups, some company tie-ups. First and foremost, let's talk about the some history of where we were and where we are now. In that top left-hand chart, you've got leverage versus uh, free cash flow asset distributions. Historically speaking, leverage above 4.5, um, cash flows were negative. Um, we were building, 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 building. Fast forward to today, post COVID, capital discipline. Now we've got healthy cash flows on the bottom. All the dots moved to the right. The orange area are, for the most part, above zero. We've got a few stragglers down below. The other big piece of this is leverage. Leverage has come down significantly, well below four for most companies. However, what that done, what's that, what this market environment has done, as you can see on the right hand side, is it sort of collapsed the EV to EBITDA multiples. So you might say, well, these companies are bargains. Well, yes, but everybody's looking at the same growth trajectory. So if I believe in growth, I don't necessarily want to sell at a bargain today. So I would say on the buyer side, Let's not get too greedy and look for opportunities to um, share in some of the long-term growth. And in the seller side, I say, let's not get too greedy, look for those same opportunities, but don't necessarily discount the fact that you may not have the vertical integration and some of the ability to capture volumes all the way through the value chain. And so if you get too aggressive on growth will benefit everyone, you may not realize the value that cooperation has in feeding, you know, feeding, driving synergies to feed volumes through the full value chain and ultimately have growth be even bigger. Um, here's a recent, uh, you know, getting closer to the wellhead. Here's some of that, those recent tie-ups there with Crestwood and ET, ET and Lotus, Targa and Lucid, EPD and Navitas, and you can see the multiples there at the top. 
um, and and some of the the you know forward year EBITDA expectations. I mean, the big por portion of it here is you've got this environment where you've got Permian NGL egress. It continues to grow. I find it very very interesting to look back at 25 when when NGLs were a byproduct because you had less than a million barrels. Um, you know, ultimately being produced to a point in 2027 where you have 3.5 million barrels of being produced. The key point here, back to our M&A strategy and for you know major players, is EPD, ET, Targa. I mean, they spent 22.5 billion dollars acquiring GNP focused companies, indicating a strategy shift from you know long-term contracting of of pipelines to one of acquiring GNP systems to fully integrate the value chain and capitalize on those molecules and de-risk downstream infrastructure development that will likely happen in the future as we hit constraints on frac and as we hit constraints on exports, as you saw in the NGL section. But again, you'll sort of permeates through uh, crude we talked about and certainly gas we've talked about. So, you know, during, um, during this period, um, we expect this to be a, a highly anticipated, uh, highly um, looked after strategy in terms of trying to connect those molecules and, and connect the value chain. The other piece is, you know, do these companies need M&A to grow? This sort of gets back to that, that, you know, should we wait to sell because the market's growing? On the right hand side, we put the large caps, Targo, Williams, KMI, EPD, relative to these small caps. What you'll see here is there's not a huge differentiation. There's certainly some outliers between growth. A lot of them are at that 4.9%, 4%, you know, compound CAGR, compound annual growth rate. What is different between these companies is that the Targas, Williams, KMI, some of the larger caps of the world are growing based on investments in vertical integration and in their infrastructure, whereas the smaller, many of the small caps are growing, you know, based on price increases and organic growth through those, you know, through those price increases. So I, you know, it's a different sort of, the numbers look the same, but it's definitely a different sort of dynamic that's at play here. DTM, certainly an exception on that side. They've got some um, Haynesville growth, um, uh, uh, Haynesville growth projects and, and certainly some stuff in the Northeast. If you flip down to the bottom graph, that EBITDA CAGR, it is a different environment. And while we don't expect it to return to this environment where we're overspending on, on um, you know, on these long haul projects in, in terms of to, in ter to, uh, to drive growth, excuse me, um, that's what that blue area represents is those 2015 to 2019 EBITDA CAGRs. We're flipping to this environment of 23 to 27 where you have lower growth. So we're in a market where there is less availability of big capital projects in order to invest in, acquisitions can be a way of scaling some of that growth by getting synergies, whether, they, whether they're cost synergies or revenue synergies in order to capture more value in the chain and thus lift the growth estimates. I wouldn't expect 23 to 27 to return to the days of 25 to 2019, but there certainly are some acquisition M&A opportunities to get that growth um, and why some of that growth might be important going forward. Uh, here again, we're talking about recent exports um, or recent exposure to tier two basins. Um, this is that sort of third strategy of Nextera sticks pipeline, or excuse me, the Nextera sticks assets with KMI, Williams with several, Curitan, Rocky Mountain Midstream, Mountain West. You know, those were big projects um, for them to invest in sort of long-term development of, of a tier two basin, which again, we, we talked about with respect to the West market and growing um, supply there. And then um, ET and Enable sort of fits that mold too with their exposure to the Anadarko. So again, these are points where we're getting access to um, export markets and or tier two basins, which we believe will come into play longer term, certainly start to ebb in this decade or start to see that filter into this decade, as you saw 2BCF of growth, remember that from our, at least our gas side of things, um, but then flip over into the you know into 2030 where it becomes a real potential um, for those markets um, you can see on the top right hand chart again that's 30 percent of gas export demand or exports will make up 30 percent of total demand excuse me and as we talked about with crude and ngls those are growing markets that continue to expand and and need prioritization last slide 
we are running right on the wire here. I hope you can all stay with me for one second because this is this is the money slide in terms of M&A tie-ups. I don't have time to go into all of these, but what the team did is they looked at scale, they looked at exports, they looked at tier through two exposure, they ranked those and said, you know, how do these fit in terms of a tie-up between Plains and Newstar, between Targa and Inlink, Enterprise and Western, Kinder Morgan and DT Midstream, and Energy Transfer and Plains. You know, for, certainly with the Plains and Newstar, these are two lower growth companies. We see about $57 million in potential commercial synergies as you tie up these two, those two systems. You know, you vertically integrate volumes into PA's long haul system via, you know, from Newstar. You, you know, expand dominance and crude gathering. You gain direct access to some export terminals. Um, you're bundling services to, to, to provide more of a diverse and stable refined products pipelines. You know, these are things or elements of a tie up that seem really critical. Endlink Targa, a big one. Uh, Endlink might be a little bit of the bell of the ball, so to speak. I mean, we tied them up with Targa here, but honestly, they can pair with a lot of companies because they're really interesting in the fact that they have a lot of GMP that you know ties with both Targa, but EPD and ET too, in terms of their, their Permian assets. They have some tier two exposure with respect to Anadarko and downstream NGL uh, capabilities in Louisiana. Um, there's about $500 million in synergies that we see there um, between NGL pipelines, fractionation and NGL exports. That's a big deal. Um, and it could be a very interesting to see if, if this hits the bingo card in, in 2024. Uh, Enterprise and Western consolidating EPD's ownership in some pipelines. Um, you get to add to e EPD's Permian um, GMP position, um, you know, and eventually divert those volumes down. Uh, the, the NGL business, we see about $200 million in potential synergies there between, again, NGL's fractionation, NGL exports. Kinder Morgan DT, this expands into the Haynesville. Um, again, some of that exposure to exports, you've got, um, you know, some of their, their Northeast stuff between, you know, Nexus and Millennium and, um, you know, these are important pipelines for the Northeast, and we talked about the Northeast growth story there, um, $75 million in potential commercial synergies. And then, of course, now we'll flip planes on the acquired side. ET has already been adding scale to its crude business via Lotus. The combination of the two would, you know, sort of turbocharge those efforts um, and make, you know, ET certainly one of the largest long-haul transporters, $100 million in commercial synergies. Um, so we sort of put a bunch of, of uh, collapse those together. Again, the bingo card, we'll see if that plays out in 2024, how many of these play out. Okay, this one's important. We're going on the road. So January 22nd, we're going to be down in Houston. We will make a trip to New York. We will likely make a trip to Dallas. Click that RSVP when you get this deck. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to put you on the agenda. We might even do some happy hours and, and sort of joint presentation stuff. Um, but we'd love to share some of the detailed decks, dig into some of the weeds that I did not have time to get to today, as well as some of these high-level thoughts, and get you in touch with the analysts that put a lot of this content together and made all this magic happen. Um, they are going to be on the road um, divulging some of their deep, dark secrets about how the energy market will unfold. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. I, I appreciate it. We're going to send out a PDF report tomorrow. You, you will have access to, there's going to be an executive summary online for each of these verticals. There's videos out there. Um, there will be the link to this presentation. There will be a, a recording of this presentation. All of that will go out. It will be on the website. Check it out. Download it. Um, you know, share it with your family over Christmas because I'm sure that's what you all want to do instead of do what my family's which going to do, which is going to be watch, um, you know, some of our favorite Christmas shows with Home Alone and um, you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So happy holidays. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Join us on the road. Give us a call. We'd love to share what we're doing. Sign up there for the Daily Note. Um, we'd love to have you a part of the community, whether it's Daily Note, whether it's crude, or whether it's something else. So thank you all for coming and joining us. I appreciate your time. We will get outbound with questions. So I've, I've gathered them all here. I did not have time and I apologize for that. Hopefully I answered a lot of them. Um, but we'll send those out and have the analysts reach directly out to you and, and answer all of your questions as soon as possible. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Have a wonderful rest of your week.